Members, to please take their seats as we move to question time. And first of all, it's question time to the Office of First Minister and Deputy First Minister. And I call Sandra Overett. Mrs. Overett. Question number one, please. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister McCann to uh, answer this question. We very much welcome the report which the Safeguarding Board has recently produced on e-safety messages. Indeed, Junior Minister Bell and myself were present at the launch to provide our support. We believe that the report's findings represent a major step forward in addressing how e-safety messages should be relayed within today's fast-moving online community. We support the recommendations in the report and in particular the need for the Executive to develop an overarching strategic and coordinated approach to e-safety. We believe that we must act now to ensure our children are protected in all aspects of their lives and that our approach should be consistent with the best child protection principles. That is why Junior Minister Bell and I have written to the Minister of Health asking him to take forward the development of a policy framework on e-safety as part of his responsibility for child protection. We have also advised the Minister that we believe that delivering social change governance structures provide the mechanism through which this framework can be developed and we have undertaken to provide whatever support we can to assist him in his role. We also note and support the report's recommendation for the establishment of an e-safety forum which has been taken forward by the Safeguarding Board. We believe that the report's findings on the quality, accessibility and impact of current e-safety messages will provide a critical contribution to the work of that forum. Our officials will be meeting with the Safeguarding Board shortly to discuss OFMDFM participation in the forum. In addition, since the publication of the report, we have helped to promote Safer Internet Day on the 11th of February, both through ministerial visits to schools and through the issue of press releases on internet safety, both locally and in conjunction with the UK Safer Internet Centre. Question number seven and eight has been withdrawn. Mrs O'Brien. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Junior Minister uh, for that response. Uh, the Junior Minister, I'm sure, knows only too well that good advice is available, um, but there is a failure in getting the right message across and the same message to all Northern Ireland's children. And so um, it's government's responsibility to ensure that, um, that all departments work together and to enable this to happen. And I refer uh, primarily to the development of a policy framework. I encourage the member to come to your question. Yes. Um, can the Junior Minister confirm then that the Health Minister has, has agreed to take on the formation of this uh, strategy and also if she has any um, further time frame for, for this strategy to be drawn up. Okay, well, I mean, I thank the member for her question. The member will be aware that we all attended the launch of the, the report and we have written to the Minister. We haven't um, yet received a reply from the Minister of Health but certainly, I mean, the, the fact that it is a, such a cross-cutting issue, we have um, actually said to the Health Minister, because he has overall responsibility for child protection policy, but we are willing to work with him in terms of the delivery social frame, our delivery social change framework, in terms of using that for a governance structure, because we realise that it's a cross-departmental, cross-cutting issue, and a member will be aware in meetings even we have attended with herself, you know, that, that, that we will be um, fully supportive of the recommendations made in the report, and um, particularly we play our role um, also with the safety forum as well. Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker, Rogers. and thanks to the Minister for her answers thus far. Minister, many of those young people who are cyberbullied are reluctant to tell a teacher or a parent or a trusted friend even. Could I ask, what is the executive doing to ensure that? that this message has got out there and this, this stigma is stamped out? Well, again, I, mean, I would say to the member that, that we um, in our department are taking particular measures. I mean, during the Internet Safety Day, which we, ha um, we, we visited two schools, a primary school, St Ida's, and we also visited um, uh, Wellington College. And basically what we were doing there was we were discussing with the local um, children and young people, you know, how are they actually you know feel in relation to if they've had issues like that that they have um, encountered and you know what's the best way because we feel it's very very necessary to also when we're raising the awareness to make sure that the children and young people themselves are coming across with ideas we also commissioned um, research to gain a better uh, 
the better sense of how P7, for instance, are using the internet because we realise that the children uh, are, are getting younger using digital, the digital world. And we had a review of activity on internet safety right across departments as well. So, and as I said, we do in our department uh, have engagement also with the, the Safer Internet Centre, the UK Safer Internet Centre. So, I mean, there are a number of things that we're doing, but particularly it's about raising the awareness and uh, working with um, parents and teachers and the children themselves to see the best way forward. Dahi Mackay. Mr Mackay. Kesh Devaradou, question number two. Uh, the First Minister and I will travel to the United States in early March to promote uh, inward investment opportunities on the West Coast. Uh, we will also travel to Washington, D.C. to attend a number of high-profile political events connected with the annual St. Patrick's Day celebrations. On Monday, the 10th of March, we will meet with HBO's President of Production and six other top executives. Uh, we met HBO for the first time in Los Angeles in 2009 when we persuaded them to take a leap of faith to locate the production of the Game of Thrones uh, series here. We will also support the Cinemagic charity at an evening event in Los Angeles that will include young people from disadvantaged backgrounds from here and LA. Uh, we will then travel to San Jose to meet with Seagate's senior management team. As you know, Seagate Technology is one of our most prestigious high-tech companies whose facility in Derry employs over 1,300 people. The company uh, makes a major contribution to the economy of the North West and this is our first opportunity to meet Seagate's senior management team at its US headquarters and we look forward to it. We will host an investment luncheon for over 120 Silicon Valley business executives to discuss the merits of doing business uh, here. Uh, later uh, that day, we will travel to San Francisco to officiate at the official opening of Invest NI's new office on the West Coast. Uh, the remainder of our time in the United States will be spent in Washington, D.C., where we will participate in a range of other engagements connected with the St. Patrick's Day celebrations. Dahi McCann. Mr. McCann. Uh, Gordon Agat, uh, can clear. Clearly, uh, job creation and inward investment need to continue to be uh, a top priority for OFM, DFM and the executive, and especially I can clear, uh, given the recent job losses we've seen at KPL and been given. Uh, can I ask uh, the Deputy First Minister, could he outline just how important uh, foreign direct investment from the United States is to the local economy, uh, and how will the executive position itself to increase uh, such investment? Well, I absolutely agree with the member. The loss of uh, 200 jobs through uh, KP KPL's difficulties in Dungiven is very, very uh, disappointing. But in recent years, uh, we have become increasingly successful in attracting foreign direct investment, particularly from a number of key United States-owned multinational companies such as Citi, uh, Seagate, Technology, Allstate, Caterpillar and uh, Liberty Mutual. Uh, the companies have sought to capitalise and build on the success of these investments and many have already reinvested or are currently preparing to invest more. Attracting and retaining foreign direct investment is an important means of promoting economic growth in a region such as ours. Foreign owned firms are associated with the higher levels of productivity, wealth creation through exports and the introduction of new skills and technologies. The United States is one of our largest target markets for FDA and as such plays a major role in the development of the economy. And just within the last week, the First Minister and myself attended a very important engagement hosted by the Japanese uh, uh, ambassador to London, uh, where we met with a very large group of Japanese uh, business people and senior executives. And I think the, uh, the evidence of success is, is very, very clear when we've had three very important job announcements for Derry, for Carrick Fergus and for Larne, from three Japanese companies, uh, all in the course of the last uh, couple of months. So foreign direct investment is very, very important, but also uh, we understand the huge importance of our own indigenous businesses and the massive contribution that they make towards uh, employment. And that's why we are so disappointed at the uh, collapse of uh, the uh, company in uh, Dungiven, which has left uh, 200 people on the dole queue. And obviously we hope that every effort will be made to ensure that they get uh, support 
to find further employment. Uh, Sammy Wilson. <coughs> Mr. Wilson. Mr. Speaker, does he anticipate that his in, uh, trip to uh, Washington and to America will produce sufficient jobs to replace the 1,600 potential job losses as a result of the way in which his party and the SDLP have been dragging their feet on welfare reform? Well, I think it's very important to emphasise that uh, the the, the whole issue of welfare cuts, I I note the, the member chooses to use the word reform, the whole issue of welfare cuts that we have been told uh, has estimated from the NICFA contribution to this debate, which many people thought was widely exaggerated, at 750 million to the local economy each year. That was then downgraded by other experts who told us that it would represent not a loss of 750 million to the economy, but something like 450 million to the economy. This is big stuff. And I think there's a huge responsibility on all of us to do everything in our power to ensure that whatever outcome that we reach in this uh, protects the most marginalised and disadvantaged uh, within our society. And my party has been involved, even in the course of the last week, uh, in further discussions with representatives of the British Government, with further discussions to take place in the time ahead. John Dallet. Mr. Dallet. Mr. Speaker, I'm sure the Deputy First Minister would agree with me that a satisfactory outcome of the uh, Haas process would greatly influence uh, potential inward investment from America. Will he be discussing the Haas process with political representatives, which I know might depend on getting an invite to the White House? Well, uh, I uh, don't think there's any possibility whatsoever of us travelling to the United States and uh, not being the subject of a conversation around the whole issue of the Haas process, given that Richard Haas and Megan O'Sullivan are two highly respected uh, diplomats uh, and well-known on Capitol Hill. So I think that uh, there can be no doubt whatsoever that the United States of America uh, remains very engaged in this work. After all, the Vice President of the United States, Joe Biden, took a very personal interest, and I know that President Obama has done similarly. So I think that uh, we can be sure that the report back from Richard Haas to the State Department and to the White House uh, will be a very accurate report on uh, how we found ourselves in a scenario where we couldn't go forward with agreement from the five parties. Uh, I'm certainly uh, very honoured that my party was prepared to sign up for the Haas proposals, Uh, and I think that the big challenge ahead is to continue to explore how we can conclude an agreement that will see us all move forward on the very important issues of the past parades and flag symbols and emblems. Mike Nesbitt. Mr Nesbitt. Mr Speaker, thank you. Question three. Uh, With your permission, Mr Speaker, I will ask Junior Minister McCann to answer this question. On the 10th of February, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister announced that £33 million will be invested in 23 projects, which represent the first tranche of projects to be delivered through this important programme. These 12 capital projects and 11 revenue projects aim at tackling poverty and deprivation through improved community-based services and facilities, represent the beginning of an exciting period of innovation, community-led cooperation and, most importantly, delivery against the most important objectives which this executive is required to meet. The projects range across all nine social investment zones and demonstrate that despite the challenge of addressing the most durable issues in the most difficult circumstances, the executive remains committed to delivering social change through significant investment, working with communities and through the community in the the areas of greatest need. These first 23 projects have been identified as priorities by local steering groups in each zone and letters of offer will issue to the successful projects following completion of verification and governance checks which are now taking place. The release of funding to each project is subject to all necessary approvals being made but we have made significant progress in cutting through the red tape requirements of managing public funds to accelerate delivery to address local needs. Mr Nesbitt. Speaker, thank you. Perhaps you indulge me. When, when the Deputy First Minister said Dr Haas is reporting to the White House and the State Department, not with my authority, he wasn't. But Mr Speaker, I, I thank the Junior Minister uh, for her answer. 
given that your colleague, the Deputy First Minister, the First Minister, uh, the Executive and indeed the Assembly uh, all agree the economy uh, is front and centre of our work, particularly in the programme for government, uh, can the Junior Minister explain why the business people who were supposed to sit on the zonal advisory panels, after all this time, have not been appointed despite uh, the support and offer of encouragement and help from organisations like business and the community? Well, the member would be fully aware that the steering groups that were set up were, were actually um, decided in terms of the people who were coming forward by people in local communities. This was always a community up sort of approach. And, you know, I, I think that, that the steering group membership does, as you say, include voluntary and community sector and, and political members. Um, I think that, that what the, the idea was in the beginning when the steering groups were first set up was that they, they would be inviting other people on as soon as the, the projects were identified that, that were going forward. Um, and they basically, um, in my opinion, that, that would have been the right way to do that because there was, nobody, there was no point in bringing someone on from a, a, a group that had no sort of um, impact on the particular projects that the community were deciding. And it's very, very important to remember that it was these projects have been, uh, have been actually um, brought forward by the community. Um, the people who live in those areas, who work in those areas, and who know what the area, local areas need. So I think that, that in terms of, um, you know, in, in terms of the nominations that came forward, that there has been a broad sort of um, a broad church of people that have been brought on board. But certainly, um, the community and the voluntary sector would have had the primacy role in, in that in the, in the first stages. Gregory Campbell. Mr Campbell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, looking forward to the next stage of the Social Investment Fund, uh, would the Junior Minister agree with me that there is a need for all of the communities, particularly in the uh, Social Investment Zones, to ensure that agreement is reached about the very essential and necessary projects that can deliver real change in their communities for the next round? No, I certainly would agree with the member because, I mean, the, the, the thing is that, again, just to reiterate what I've just said, this is a, a community-led process and, indeed, I mean, the, the community were very, very much uh, involved in the setting up of the steering groups in terms of who went forward for nominations, but there was a lot of consultation and the community representatives who are on those groups and the voluntary representatives are going back into local communities to actually ask the, the stakeholders in those communities what actually the area needs and it also dovetails in with other area plans in those local communities so yes I would agree that, that it's very important that those particular needs are met. Broadwood McGann. Good. Can I ask the junior, junior Minister what will happen if some of the projects fail their economic appraisal? Well, yes, I, um, I said a member, I'm not sure if you have any specific project in mind, but the projects that are undergoing economic appraisal are those projects which each zone has already prioritised. Um, and in light of that, I think it's very important that we work with um, steering groups and project promoters because we also need to be giving feedback to those, um, those people to, to actually, you know, when, when, when some of the projects don't make the economic appraisal stage, why they're not, they're not meeting the requirements. And I also think it's important because um, we need to, to make sure that that consultation is continuing and that dialogue and engagement is continuing with our officials and those steering groups on the ground. Sam Gardner. Mr Gardner. Question number four, Mr Speaker. Uh, we will continue to improve our preparedness for severe weather and other emergencies through the work of the Civil Contingencies Group and other groups of key responders. The Civil Contingencies Group is the principal strategic emergency preparedness body for the public sector, comprising representatives from departments and agencies, the emergency services and from district councils. Just over a year ago, OFM DFM, which chairs this multi agency group, put new and enhanced arrangements in place to ensure effective delivery of the civil contingencies group's functions. Members identify, agree, and oversee the delivery of priority work to enhance our collective capability to prepare for a range of emergencies. Severe weather emergencies and the damage and impacts of these are a key element of this work programme which continues to develop in response to identified need. For example, in line with good practice, following the spring uh, blizzard of 2013, the Civil 
contingencies group members participated in a multi-agency debrief to capture learning from the emergency, uh, and this has since been incorporated into actions being delivered by the civil contingencies group. In a similar way, learning from a recent uh, coastal flooding test exercise and the actual emergency at the start of this year uh, will be used to inform the further development of this work programme. As a member of the Civil Contingencies Group, the Met Office takes an active part in progressing the Civil Contingencies agenda here by advising on weather issues. A meeting of the Met Office's Public Weather uh, Service Customer Group was held in October 2013 and proved very useful in developing a fuller understanding of the services offered by the Met Office to assist emergency planners. OFMDFM does not provide a central funding stream for the civil contingencies function, rather the individual departments fund emergency preparedness within their own organisations and sectors. Sam Gardner. Thank, thank Mr. you, Gardner. Mr. Speaker. And I do thank the, the Deputy First Minister for his response in, in length. But would the Deputy First Minister join uh, with me in congratulating the Police Service for Northern Ireland for the exemplary role they played in the preparing for the recent threatened flooding event at Sydenham in Belfast, and would he also outline what fast track arrangements are in place to deploy the troops locally stationed in the event of serious flooding in Northern Ireland? Well, I absolutely and wholeheartedly uh, congratulate and pay tribute to the PSNA for the lead role that they played in working with all departments and all groups involved in civil contingencies uh, situations. I, I think they've done a tremendous job. And, and I think when you consider what has been happening in the southeast of England and indeed in the south of Ireland and places like Cork and Limerick and Kilkenny, uh, we've been very lucky to escape the worst effects of flooding uh, on this occasion. Uh, and I certainly hope that we can come through uh, what has been a very difficult uh, winter in a way that uh, ensures that our farmers and uh, our homes, uh, particularly homes in the most vulnerable areas, will uh, escape the uh, very high levels of uh, rainfall that's uh, affecting us uh, at the moment. Uh, there aren't any plans whatsoever uh, in relation to the involvement of troops, uh, and I think we will always be uh, you know, working very closely through the civil contingencies group uh, and working with the advice of the PSNI in relation to how we deal uh, with these situations. Sammy Douglas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and could I uh, thank the Deputy First Minister for his um, uh, so far. Um, could I ask the Deputy First Minister if he would agree with me that the executive should be working with local groups who are involved in contingency work, such as the, the Conswater Community Greenway, who received uh, tremendous support and the evaluation of floods in East Belfast um, recently? Well, obviously, that, that's a hugely important project, and I agree absolutely with the member that we all have to be working in a very joined up way to ensure that communities, civil contingencies groups, the uh, departments, and the PSNI all working together can alleviate uh, the challenges that we face in relation to uh, extreme weather. Uh, and I know there's one or two skeptics about global warming and uh, all the rest of it in the house and he's now looking up at me <laughs> with a big smile on his face but uh, I think the rest of us do believe that the rest of us do believe the scientists uh, when they tell us that we are facing uh, enormous change on the planet <laughs> we believe the ones that we want to believe <laughs> not the ones that you would want us to believe but uh, more seriously it is an important subject uh, of that there is no doubt, and I think that uh, we have all come to the conclusion that something very dramatic is happening to our weather, and in turn that can have a massive impact on people's lives. So yes, we have to work together, community, civil contingencies and the police to ensure that we head off at the pass dangerous situations. Pat Chicken. I wonder, could the Minister give us uh, an idea of the central response uh, to the recent weather emergencies? Well, I mean, as, as I've said, I think it's very important that we deal with uh, each issue on its merits in relation to the different challenges that the weather uh, throw up at us. 
and, and we have to take account of each situation as it arises, and that, that's what we're doing. The important thing is that we have a high level of preparedness, and I think that that has stood by us and has ensured for the most part that people have been protected. Uh, when serious incidents arise, the relevant minister has the opportunity uh, to raise the issue of funding, for example, at the executive and with the finance minister to seek additional support if they feel that is required. So, as I say, we look at each uh, situation on its merits and we make uh, our decisions based on that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, given that uh, the adverse weather has caused a lot of damage along our coastal roads uh, and has caused, in my opinion, a crisis within the fishing community, uh, particularly our glass, Kilkeel, and Port of Ogie, uh, could I ask the Minister would he agree that more help is needed, including financial, um, for those? Well, I, I certainly uh, have a lot of sympathy for what the member has said. It, it's undoubtedly a very difficult time for the fishing community with the poor weather over the last few months and uh, it really has meant that they haven't been able to uh, put to sea uh, as much as they would like and I think that, that has undoubtedly caused hardship. We all know that the main fishing season runs from April to October so we are hoping that things will improve but the Dard Minister, Michelle O'Neill, has agreed to meet representatives of the fishing industry. I think that meeting is happening tomorrow, and she will discuss with them what assistance might be available. Michelle was also able to support the industry last year by paying for landing fees and satellite equipment to the value of £400,000 in order to offset overheads, and I know that she is dedicated to seeing the industry uh, be sustainable for the future. Agreed. Question 5, Mr Speaker. Uh, there, there is no uh, current agreement on May's uh, long cash. Uh, we continue to discuss a way forward with this important project. The Development Corporation continues to ensure the site is secure and maintained uh, and is progressing plans to facilitate the Royal Ulster Agricultural Society show on the site in May 2014. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his crisp reply. Um, Deputy First Minister, what, what are the continuing costs of the corporation? And, and you've mentioned some of the work they're currently undertaking. Uh, is there anything of a strategic nature involved in that work? Well, we, we'll, we'll write to the member with the specific costs of the corporation. I don't have that at hand at the moment, except to say that uh, they are a very important body and have a very important uh, function, uh, in the, certainly in my hope that at some stage in the future we can see the difficulties that afflict us in relation to the further development of the site resolved in a way that will uh, progress the employment prospects of many uh, thousands of people out there who are looking for jobs. I, I think that at the minute their work is uh, really involved in ensuring that the Royal Ulster Agricultural Society show uh, goes ahead, that the Royal Ulster Agricultural Society project on that site is developed. Uh, and I am certainly uh, a big fan of the RUAS. I think their very courageous move from Balmoral uh, to the site was a tremendous vote of confidence in the site. And I think the fact that they had such a massive increase in attendance at their show uh, last year, uh, and probably will do so again uh, this year, uh, certainly shows that there is huge community support for the development of this site. So I, I look forward to the difficulties uh, that uh, are before us being resolved in a way that will see us develop a site uh, consistent with uh, the original uh, vision, uh, which is really about providing employment uh, for our people. Owen McGuinness. Mr McGuinness. Thank you very much. And I listen very carefully, Mr Speaker, to the Deputy First Minister. And I share with him the sense of loss in terms of the vision of developing this site uh, the loss of the stadium and also the loss in terms, at least temporarily at least, uh, in terms of Peace and Reconciliation Centre. Uh, has the Deputy First Minister uh, uh, and the First Minister entered into any discussions with the uh, European Commission in relation to any of the lost funding? Well, I, I think that uh, the Member will know as much as anybody else in uh, this room that the SEUPB uh, are the people who then take up the uh, challenge of uh, how that funding is effectively distributed uh, against the backdrop of uh, 
the non-development of the Peace Building and Conflict Resolution Centre. I think it's important to stress that this was a project that caught the imagination of the international community. This was a project that caught the imagination of President Obama himself in the White House, uh, the US State Department, uh, the European Union. President Barroso was very much involved and very excited uh, by this uh, project. And uh, I haven't given up hope. Order members, that includes all questions to the Deputy First Minister. We now move to topical questions. And I call Phil Flanagan. Mr. Flanagan. Um, I know that the, the Deputy First Minister has recently and, and rightly condemned the disgraceful race, racial abuse directed towards her Assembly colleague, Anna Lowe. Um, would the Deputy First Minister like to take this opportunity to join with me in condemning all online racist, sectarian, and sexist abuse directed towards our public representatives? Well, uh, I, think, I think the first thing to say is that uh, I was appalled and absolutely disgusted that a member of this House, Anna Lou, hugely respected as an elected representative, hugely respected in the community, could be subjected to such vile treatment. And I think Anna Lou stands head and shoulders stands head and shoulders above all of those bigots, racist criminals out there who quite clearly uh, attempted to target her through the social uh, networks in the course of the last number of days. There isn't a lot that we can do in terms of the reality that on pl th places like Twitter there are all sorts of headbangers. There are all sorts of people out there who are very, very racist and who use every opportunity to try and uh, influence uh, situations for their own benefit. But there is one thing that we can do as elected representatives. There is one thing that we must do as elected representatives, and that is that we must be seen to be standing together without any equivocation whatsoever and unreservedly condemning the activities of these people. So I stand by Anna Lowe. I'm sure the vast majority of people in our community stand with her also. But we have to raise our voices. We have to get angry about this. And we have to make it absolutely clear to everybody in society that not one single member of this House is prepared to tolerate the abuse, not just of a member of this House, but anybody within society who is subjected to either sectarian or racist abuse. Phil Flanning. Gorham, I got the Akion Korlyuk of School and Bugis lesson, Kokiad Era, as a Fragress Silier show. I thank the, the Minister for his very clear and, um, and concise answer. Does the Deputy First Minister agree that in circumstances where a public representative is abused, whether it's online or elsewhere, that it's incumbent on all political representatives and all political parties? to condemn such threats and abuse plainly and unequivocally? Well, I, I, I certainly absolutely agree that where uh, people are uh, inflicting sectarian abuse, racist abuse on any elected representatives, it's very, very important that all of us speak out and speak out very loudly indeed so that everybody in society will know where we as the political leaders of our society are coming from. I, I think it's hugely important that, that we show solidarity. It's hugely important that we make it uh, absolutely clear that this is unacceptable behaviour. And it's also, I think, incumbent upon all of us uh, at a time whenever uh, racism and sectarianism is clearly out there in society, uh, that we defend not just elected representatives, we defend anybody who has been affected by racist abuse. And we have seen in the course of the last couple of weeks people from uh, different ethnic groups having their cars targeted, having their homes targeted, and absolutely disgusting behaviour. We have to stand by all of those people, not just elected representatives. We have to stand by everybody in society because we should understand and know that people who come here and contribute to our society to be subjected to that type of abuse must be a very lonely place for them to be. We have to let them hear where we stand 
and we have to stand with them. Judith Cochran. Mrs Cochran. Thank you, Mr Speaker. <clears throat> Can the Deputy First Minister clarify his view on how much weight should, uh, public authority should give to Equality Commission advice on fair employment practices? Well, I, I think it's, it's very important that where there is uh, Equality uh, Commission advice that that is uh, taken very seriously into consideration uh, by all groups. I think it's also very important that we uh, recognise the huge challenges that there are within society where there is a clear perception of inequality that organisations like the Equality Commission have to be uh, in the promulgation of their views uh, t taken very seriously indeed. Judith Cochran. Thank you, Deputy First Minister. Can I then ask him, does he think that the Executive or the Policing Board should disregard uh, the concerns of the Equality Commission that the current criteria for appointing a Chief Constable may be discriminatory towards women, towards those with dependents or those with disabilities? Well, I, I am sure that the, uh, the Policing Board and everybody else, including the Executive, uh, will take into very serious consideration uh, what is said by the Equality Commission. Uh, I think that uh, on this particular subject uh, th there has been discussion about this, uh, both at, at the Executive and uh, outside of the Executive, and further discussions uh, will uh, happen over the course of the next uh, very short period. Danny Kenahan. Thank, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And I would like to ask the Deputy First Minister what actions his department has agreed with the Education Minister regarding shared education and the funding of it? Well, I, I think that uh, the whole issue of uh, shared education and how we uh, continue to promote that and encourage it is something that the First Minister and myself take very seriously indeed. And I think the evidence of that is the uh, way in which the uh, Education Minister has uh, gone forward into the community to provide further encouragement to people during the process of consultation uh, to bring forward uh, further ideas and suggestions for the further development of shared education within our society. And of course the uh, iconic scheme in OMA where we will have uh, six schools uh, coming together on the uh, former military site at uh, Lissanelli uh, is a very clear indicator of where we uh, want to go on this particular matter. I think it's hugely important that we continue to provide opportunities for our young people uh, to come together and to do so in meaningful ways as opposed to you know, what some people might have thought in the past were symbolic ways. I think that this new approach is something that's likely to gain uh, huge support within our society. And Danny Cunningham. Thank you very much, and uh, I welcome any move forward on shared education. But in last week's debate, the DUP amendment took out all reference to sharing in education other than the shared campuses and the signature projects. And the DFM's party support, supported it by abstaining. So does the Deputy First Minister actually believe in trying to reach a long-term goal of a single shared education system? Well, uh, I think there can be no doubt whatsoever that uh, our, our commitment as an executive to shared education is absolute. We all understand the importance of uh, having our children from different religious denominations come together in meaningful ways and I think that the projects that we are presently encouraging through the Department of Education are a very clear evidence base for where we want to go. I think the First Minister and I have been on the, the public record, for example, if we were starting without the baggage of history, with a clean sheet of paper uh, in terms of uh, uh, a single education system, that we would absolutely both favour that. But we have to deal with the, re the real politic of where education is at and the fact that people want choice, people who are out there uh, believe in choice, and uh, we certainly believe that people should have the opportunity to choose, but to do so in a way which presents all of the individual sectors within education with uh, a big question to answer. And the big question is whether or not they accept, and I think the vast majority of people do, 
that we need to progress and accelerate a process of bringing our young people together and the shared education campuses, the other shared education projects that DE are involved in, I think are it's a very clear testimony of our commitment to uh, education uh, and sharing uh, with our young people. Adrian McQuillan. Mr McQuillan. Thank you Mr Speaker. Can the Tavery First Minister confirm that the funding is ring funds for the Northern Zone under the Social Investment Fund? That the funding is, is ring funced for the Northern Zone of the Social Investment Fund? Right, I'll ask the uh, Junior Minister to answer that question, Jennifer McCann. <laughs> no, well, I mean, uh, when I was speaking earlier about the Social Investment Fund, the allocations have all been set out in that. And when the fund is, is in fact ring fenced, it's not obviously within the baseline of the OFM DFM um, department. What it is, is is in DFP because it's a central fund and it's an executive fund. But certainly, I mean, the money will be ring fenced um, for the Social Investment Fund in its entirety, yes. Adrian McQuillan. Thank you, Speaker. Although only 500,000 has been confirmed and announced so far, when does she think her department will be in a position to announce all her projects in the Northern Zone? Well, the Northern Zone would be like any other zone, and if there's projects there that have already been approved, which uh, uh, I am aware there have been, then what happens? Well, the, the projects, um, the next tranche um, of projects coming forward, you know, when they meet the economic um, appraisal and they meet the criteria that, that is there within that economic appraisal, then that will, they will go forward. The difficulty is at the moment there's some projects um, across all zones, it's not just in the northern zone, but across all zones that aren't at that particular stage yet. And our officials are actually out and engaging and consulting with the steering groups at the moment to help, first of all, bring them up to the stage that they need to be at and for to tell them why they're not at that stage. So, I mean, that ongoing engagement is there. And certainly, um, if the member wants any more information in terms of who's dealing with that particular steering group in, in the northern zone, I can, I can give them that. Trevor Long. Mr Long. Yeah, thank you, Mr Speaker. Could I ask the Deputy First Minister if, in the course of his uh, forthcoming trip to the USA, he receives a serious business inquiry about a potential investment in the Mays site? What, what advice would he give that potential investor at the present time? Well, I mean, I, I don't have any doubt that the Mays Long Cash site is a site of uh, huge national and international importance. And I have no doubt whatsoever that there are quite a number of businesses very interested in uh, seeing that site uh, develop. But I think that it is important to point out that some of the initial assessments that were done, even by people with an international reputation and development, that all of them pointed out the huge importance of the Peace Building and Conflict Resolution Centre in the context of the development of that site. That was made very, very clear to both myself and uh, that was made very, very clear to myself and to uh, the Reverend Ian Paisley when he was first minister at a very early stage of this project that they saw the Peace Building and Conflict Resolution Centre as the jewel and the crown of Mays Long Cash. Trevor Long. Yes, I uh, thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer. Un unlike the people behind me, I, I actually support the concept of a conflict transformation centre. But uh, does the Deputy First Minister think it is reasonable to allow a political disagreement within his own office to impede economic progress on the site, or potential economic progress? Well, I've, I've always described myself, I think I've been characterised by my involvement in this peace process over 20 years as being a problem solver as being a solution seeker and uh, I'm still in that mood. I think that uh, what we need to do is try and overcome uh, the difficulties that we face. Uh, I'm also very conscious uh, that there are people out there uh, who are associated with victims groups who, who feel strongly uh, about this project in relation to it not going ahead and I have every sympathy with people even though I have a different point of view. Uh, the Peace Centre was designed to be just that, a centre for peace and reconciliation. The only shrine at that centre would be a shrine to peace and reconciliation. But I'm also very conscious that there are other politically motivated people out there on the extremes of loyalism who have been attempting to use this situation and indeed on occasions use victims against this project. I think 
uh, it's time for a big debate within unionism and loyalism about how we should be moving forward in our society. Does the construction of a peace building conflict at Resolution Centre on that site contribute to us providing uh, a normal society, a society that's coming to terms with the challenges of the past but prepared to move forward in unity in the future? I clearly think it does. Members, that concludes question time to the Office of First Minister and Deputy First Minister.